Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses as we continue with part 5, Competition and Cooperation of the Brotherhood of Man by J.E. Richardson, T.K. Chapter 5, Competition and Cooperation That we may verify the great fundamental fact of nature that competition seems to be quite as universal as cooperation Go with me down to the very depths of the mineral kingdom, then follow up through the higher kingdoms to that of man himself. To the physical senses, the solid crystallized rock seems to be one of the established conditions within the mineral kingdom of nature, if we trace the purely physical and chemical mutations occurring within. We find that through the grinding power of glaciers, the disintegrating efforts of heat and cold, the burning results of the sun's rays, and the crumbling effects of the winds and rains, the largest and the hardest granite boulder in due time will crumble into the individualized particles of which it was originally composed. These are the hostile forces against which the solid rock had to contend in order to maintain its existence as such. Do we find anything here but competition, of the elements of nature with the established conditions within the stone. So far as the stone is concerned, certainly there is nothing observable that would strongly suggest the kindly influence of cooperation. Now take the same boulder and consider its life in relation to the next higher kingdom of nature, the vegetable. In due time, through the vitalizing influence of the same elements, nature forms a covering of moss upon the outer surface of the stone. Immediately the moss begins to grow and in doing so it saps the vitality of the stone and materially aids the glacier, the heat and the cold of the outer world, the wind and the rain, the frost and the dry heat of the sun, and the disintegrating process. Thus we observe that the stone is also in direct competition with the vegetable kingdom which lives off its inner life element. Hence we find that the mineral kingdom is not only in competition with the elements both within and surrounding it, but also must compete with the vegetable world which lives directly upon it. Let us go forward to the very highest form of life where also we find that man himself becomes a most powerful contributing factor in the disintegrating process that is constantly destroying the stone. Take a brief survey of some of our beautiful mountains that were. Observe how man, with his steam shovels, trucks and tractors, is tearing and wearing the solid granite into dust and to some extent denuding the mountains of much that makes them beautiful. Is this done through man's cooperation with the individual rocks or even with the mineral kingdom as a whole? No, instead here we find a powerful competitive agent in man himself. Nowhere, however, have we discovered that cooperation has had any place so far in nature's progressive plan of action, nor in the method and process whereby she accomplishes her results. Cooperation, nevertheless, does have a place and most important one when properly understood. Now let us examine the vegetable kingdom that we may discover the method which God or nature employs in the activities of this next higher kingdom. Here is a forest of pine trees that has grown from infancy to stately majesty. The individual trees are developed out of the same general conditions. They draw their life and substance from the same soil, the same sunlight, the same water, and the same air. In the beginning, they do not interfere with one another, but as they grow larger, they become more and more crowded for space. Until the soil did not contain sufficient nourishment to sustain the further growth of all the individual trees, what followed? The more rugged trees absorbed more than their equal share of nourishment, and to do this, had to take it away from the others. By degrees, the less rugged trees began to suffer and fall behind in point of vital energy and growth. The weaker ones finally began to languish and die, until at last they withered and fell to the ground. 
they had lost out of the competitive struggle with their stronger and more vigorous brothers. This situation fairly represents what Darwin defined as the struggle for existence in the midst of a hostile environment. So far as the individual tree is concerned, if the competition of its brothers became too great for any individual tree, it dies, and thus made room for its competitors to go on growing, as some of the sequoia, or big trees, of California have done for 4,000 to 5,000 years. Here we see also the evidences of cooperation running side by side with competition, but for the cooperation of the mineral kingdom in furnishing nourishment, light, heat, water, and air, even the most rugged of all trees could not have survived to maturity, nor even at all. They could not have come into being to make the struggle for existence but for these conditions. Let us now go into the realm of the animal kingdom, where the fishes live into the depths of the old ocean. Here is a realm of individual life which should give a fair and definite reflection of the method and process by which God, or nature, carries on the activities which guide the destinies of individual intelligence. For here, each individual, whether large or small, low or high, weak or powerful, intellectually keen or dull, finds itself in direct competition with those more powerful, more individually capable, and of superior intelligence. The small, the weak, the slow, and the primitive all must run the gauntlet of their superior fellows, only to be eaten and destroyed in the end. The tiniest minnow is pursued by virtually all other fishes large enough to swallow it, and if it succeeds in growing up to a normal fishhood of its kind, it is because it is wise enough or clever enough or swift enough or all these combined to compete for its own life among them. If it fails, it is swallowed by the first larger fish that is fast enough and clever enough to compete with it in the race for its individual life. But the fish that catches it is, at the same time, running from some still larger fish, and this, in turn, from one that is after it. Thus, it is that within the realm of the fishies, the large fish eats the smaller ones. Those larger eat them, and throughout the entire world in which they live, this contest goes on, so that in this particular realm of individual life, the very fundamental principle seems to depend as much upon competition as it does on cooperation. Taken now from the viewpoint of man's relation to the fishies, and here we find that man himself becomes one of the most destructive agents with which the fish must contend. Indeed, the fishies constitute one of the prolific sources of the food supply of all mankind. Make the journey throughout each and every department of individual life and you will find that the same process goes on in varying degrees, everywhere we find that the individual life is always in competition with its fellows, and with all the kingdoms of nature seemingly pitted against it. These are some of the facts of nature which impelled Darwin to promulgate the doctrine that individual life is, a struggle for existence in the midst of a hostile environment, and likewise that in this struggle only the fittest survive. Whether Darwin was correct in his conclusions or not, he furnished an abundance of evidence in the facts of nature he compiled to justify us in hesitating to accept, without vastly more positive evidence than we have been able to accumulate from history throughout the known life of humanity upon the earth, the idea that a government, even among the most highly developed and intelligently advanced human beings, entirely free from the element of competition, is a scientific possibility. In truth, if we confine ourselves to the actual known facts of nature and the demonstrated facts of science, we should be justified in holding that competition and cooperation are concomitant factors in the great scheme of nature, both animate and inanimate. The competitive principle and the cooperative principle in nature, as they are exemplified within the three lower kingdoms of nature, are the concomitant factors employed in the evolution of individualized intelligence. 
Within these lower kingdoms, the cooperative principle may be destructive to the individual life, though nature never loses sight of the ultimate goal of individual evolution upon the higher kingdom of man. Within the human kingdom, where the individual becomes morally accountable and personally responsible, the two principles are still concomitant factors in the evolutionary process, but here the competitive principle becomes doubly destructive when wrongfully employed for purely selfish purposes, in that it destroys the individual who abuses it as well as the individual or individuals against whom it is employed. In this kingdom, the cooperative principle is constructive and when rightly used by the individual becomes doubly powerful in its evolutionary impulse to the individual and in that it unites the impulse of the individual to that of nature towards the same evolutionary goal of self-completion on the part of the individual and nature's reward thereof which is individual completion and perfect happiness. Socialists tell us that the present measure of values, our current monetary system, is responsible for many of the present ills and inequalities of economic conditions. To remedy this, they propose to substitute labor as the measure of values. This means that a day's labor would be made by the unit of value instead of our present paper, money, and metal coins. In just what particular this simple substitution alone would change, or improve present conditions doth not yet appear. At present, our government owns a certain number of ounces, pounds, or tons of gold bullion stored away in its depositories for the accommodation of the people and to relieve them of the necessity of carrying around enough of the heavy gold to meet the demands of their daily business. The government issues Federal Reserve certificates issued in the form of paper money a substitute for the actual gold and gold coin itself. These various forms of currency can be readily used as a medium of exchange and, together with personal checks, bank drafts, and other forms of paper money obligations, the entire business of the people of our government is carried on with smoothness and dispatch. It is an item worth remembering that over 90% of the entire business of our country is transacted by paper money, checks, drafts, and certificates of credit in various forms without distributing a single ounce of the gold bullion in the United States depositories. Let us suppose that labor were substituted for our present medium of exchange. It would become necessary to provide a method of issuing certificates. For each and every day's work done by every individual in the United States, these labor certificates would then take the place of the present silver certificates, coin and Federal Reserve banknotes as a medium of exchange, the mere checking up of the number of days labor actually performed, and the issuance of certificates to cover them each 24 hours to say nothing of providing fractional currency to take the place of the present penny, nickel, dime, quarter, and half dollar, involve a method of registering and verifying the number of days of actual labor performed in each and every little community, and the issuance of certificates thereof, and this method must be as such as to guard against dishonest reports of labor actually done, as well as of fraud in the issuance of certificates. Thus far, no socialist has ever explained to my satisfaction how all this is to be accomplished in such a matter as to guarantee honesty and reliability in the volume of labor money thus issued. Assuming that such a system might be possible, in what way is an arbitrary labor standard of values and medium of exchange an improvement over our present arbitrary standard of values and medium of exchange? Our present monetary system may need improvement, but the proposed labor certificates does not seem to be the answer. There are many other difficulties to be met in substituting a labor standard of value and a labor medium of exchange for our present system, all of which seem to spell failure in advance if it should end with the simple substitution. Furthermore, this suggestion seems to be fully verified and confirmed by every attempt thus far made. 
until history can point to one unqualified success over a period of years. On a national scale, the burden of proof is still on socialism and not on its opponents until it succeeds in substituting cooperation for competition with government control of all capital and the annulment of private ownership of capital and land. I seriously doubt it will ever command the approval or support of the people of the United States. Thank you for watching and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment. And if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Rosies. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.